The following satellite transmission, copyrighted by the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, is available for live broadcast in 10 seconds or for taping and rebroadcasting by any AM, FM, shortwave, cable, or video outlet globally. This is a WBN Worldwide Broadcasting Network production. This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. Back in the early 1900s, the old Spreckles building on Market Street in San Francisco was 18 stories high, a tall, slender, tower-like structure, square in form, and apparently without sufficient base for a building of such height. But when the great earthquake of 1906 occurred, and the entire surface of the earth along the line of the fault was in a tremor, it was estimated by scientific studies that the swaying of the tall Spreckles building carried the center of gravity of that building beyond the baseline many times during those fearful 48 seconds of the earthquake. But when the building was erected, the wise builders had dug deep and laid the foundations rightly. The building had a steel frame, and the frame did not rest upon the loose sand, which underlies so much of San Francisco. The architect had pierced through the sand at the surface and had anchored the steel frame in great wells blasted from the solid rock and afterward filled in around the bases of the steel frame with cement. So when the 18th of April came, the great San Francisco earthquake, testing every builder's work of what sort it was, the huge weight of that swaying building was held firmly in place because it was founded upon a rock. They had dug deeply, and so said Jesus, so it is that you must build your life, not on the shifting sands, but on the eternal foundation of God's truth. Said Jesus, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. The material things of this life are but passing incidentals and are powerless to bring you real happiness. The Chinese tell a proverb about a man in Peking who dreamed of possessing a great deal of gold. That was his heart's desire. He dreamed of it every night. He thought of it every day, having gold. He rose one day, and when the sun was high, he dressed in his finest garments. He went down to the crowded marketplace. He went directly to the booth of a gold dealer, reached out and snatched a bag full of gold coins, turned and walked away. The officials who arrested him were puzzled about it. Why did you rob this gold dealer in broad daylight, they asked. And why in the presence of so many people there in the marketplace? The man replied, I didn't see any people. I saw only gold. When you covet anything, it blinds you to everything, but whatever it is you covet, whatever you're obsessing upon, whatever your compulsion is. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. His descendants, this generation, just says, give me. But declared the master, a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things he possesses. What shall it profit a man, said Jesus, if he gain the whole world? but lose his own soul. And again he said, Be not content to lay up treasure upon the earth, where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, but lay up your real treasure in heaven, where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. These are the enduring, the abiding realities. The philosophers remind humankind that you live in the eternal now, the eternal now, this moment. There is this inscription on the back of an old bronze statue of an ox that stands on the beach at Kunming Lake in Japan. It was written eight centuries before the birth of Christ. Listen to this poem. This little strip of light, twixt night and night, let me keep bright today, and let no shadow of tomorrow in sorrow from the dead yesterday gainsay my happiness today. And if tomorrow shall be sad, or never come at all, I've had, at least today, the eternal now. The flowers of all the tomorrows exist in the seeds of today, says a Chinese proverb. Dr. William Osler, the great surgeon, wrote, The load of tomorrow added to that of yesterday and carried today makes the strongest man or woman falter. We must learn to shut off the future as tightly as we shut off the past. And Pearl McGinnis has written, I have no yesterdays. Time took them away. Tomorrow may not be, but I have today. So do you. But what are you doing with it? It is written, This is the day which the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Only in the spiritual life, only in the finding and knowing of God, 
is there this profound and rock-ribbed reality of spiritual things only in God. Nothing else will accomplish it. Nothing else will provide that inner peace, that satisfaction, that joy. Did you ever hear some man say, I was an outcast. My life was meaningless. I was a wretched inebriate, a disgrace to my race, a nuisance to the world. But then, but then I began to study mathematics. And I learned the multiplication table. But since that time, I've been happy as the day is long. I feel like singing all the time. My soul is full of triumph and peace because I've memorized the multiplication table. You've never heard that. Did you ever hear a man or woman ascribe his or her salvation from intemperance and vice to the multiplication table or the sciences of mathematics or geology or chemistry? No, but multiplied millions of human beings will tell you, I was wretched. My life was a mess. I was lost. I broke my mother's heart. I was ruined, reckless, helpless, homeless, hopeless. I had a sense of despair and no future lying before me until I turned to God. And when I found the living God, I found all that I sought and more. And so can you and so will you. In this there is joy, there is liberation, there is gladness said Jesus again and again, be of good cheer. He began his Sermon on the Mount with the word happy or blessed. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. His message rang with joy. People would take their sack lunches and go out to a hillside and listen to this man talk. Because there was such a joy, such an affirmative, positive radiance to his life and to what he said. And God calls you to that radiant and joyous life as well. There is room for you. I read in a history book that in September of 1878, there was a dreadful accident on the Thames River in England when an excursion steamer named the Princess Alice was cut down by the Blywell Castle, an outward-bound merchant steamship. And in that tragic collision, more than 700 persons that day found a watery grave. But among the brave efforts which were made on that occasion to save the drowning people, one of the noblest was made by a man who had a small boat. He was at some distance from the scene of the collision, but he rowed with all his might to the midst of the struggling passengers. He pulled several of them, one after another, into his little boat, which by now was full and in danger of sinking. And he prepared to row away, but when he saw the white upturned faces in the water of many others and heard their cries, save me, don't leave me, it is said that in agony this man threw up his arms and cried out, oh God, that I had a bigger boat. God, I wish that I had a bigger boat. His heart was large enough to save all who were perishing, but his boat was simply too small. Yet it is not so with God. God's boat is bigger than that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, he said. If you will but reach out to God, if you will but call out, God has loved you as long as you have been. God has known everything you've ever wrestled with, every fear, every failing, every frustration, every doubt, every hope, every plan, every thwarted plan. God knows it all, and God loves you with an everlasting love which will not let you go. And God calls you to newness of life, fullness of life, fulfillment of life, richness of life, spiritually. You'll live fearless of life and fearless of death, with confidence, free of anxiety. There's an old poem. "'Twas when the sea's tremendous roar a little boat assailed, and pallid fear with awful power o'er each on board prevailed, save one, the captain's little son, who fearless viewed the storm, and playful with composure smiled at danger's threatening form. Why sporting thus, a seaman cried, whilst dangers overwhelm? Why yield to grief, the boy replied. My father's at the helm." Neither should you be filled with fear and anxiety in the storms of your life. Your father is at the helm. You may not know what the future holds, but you can know who holds the future. The living God who has a plan for this planet, a great project for this entire universe of universes, and a will for your life, and the power to do that will, to live that way as you were born and created to live as a son or daughter of God in faith and joy. Years ago, there used to be an old battered steel safe standing on Broadway in New York City, on which was this sign. It stood the test. The contents were all saved. For this safe had been in one of the hottest fires ever in New York City. 
But that old safe had carried all of its treasures safely through the fire. God, too, has stood the test. You are safe when you give your life to God. You can trust God with your past, your present, and with your future. You may not understand all about it intellectually. Somewhere on this planet, as you're listening to this broadcast, around the world by satellite or shortwave, you may not understand philosophically, theologically, intellectually, all that I'm saying, but something within you responds to it. And even though you may have some questions and some uncertainties, claim with faith that which your soul recognizes to be true. There was an old man in England who was uneducated. He was a day laborer. But he found a faith in God. It was late in his life. And one time he was being teased and taunted by some of his co-workers. One of them said, so you say you're a Christian. He said, what about this Jesus Christ? He said, for example, do you know anything about him, about his life? Who was his father? And the old man was puzzled and said, well, I don't know. They said, well, who was his mother? The man said, I don't know. Well, when did he live? Do you know what century? Do you know how many years ago? He said, well, I don't know. They said, where did he live? I don't know. How old was he when he died? And the old man rubbed his chin and said, oh, I don't know that for sure either. So the skeptic the doubter, the scoffer, said, well, you're a pretty fine Christian. You don't know anything about who was the father of Jesus, who his mother was, when he lived, when he died, where he lived. You couldn't show me on a map. He said, what is it that you do know that makes him so important? What do you know? And then it was that this rough but genuine old man lifted up his head and looking into the faces of those who were taunting him, he said these words, I know this much, he said, I know he changed my life. And that is the truth of it. The power of God is not just a theory, a theology, a philosophy, an idea. The power of God is an experience. The love of God is an experience which you can experience by faith this very moment listening to this broadcast. It's not just a theological theory. You may not know much about the life of Jesus or the history of religion and spiritual teachings on this earth, and yet your life can be transformed in the twinkling of an instant if you'll only have the faith to dare to believe there's a God who loves you, whose son or daughter you are, who has a plan for this planet, a will for your life, power and eternal life lying before you. And fear and anxiety and dread and foreboding will begin to melt away like an ice cube on a hot sidewalk on a Kansas summer afternoon because you'll know at last the truth of who you are spiritually. Claim that this instant in faith and all things will begin to become as new for you. And then write to us. We really want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written free literature on finding God, getting to know God, growing spiritually. Life after death, what does happen when you die? Need you fear death? What about the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, the concept this entire universe is a family, the family of God? Write for all this free literature to Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.